I'm Oliver Bannan. I'm a consultant neurologist uh, at Sheffield Teaching Hospitals. I do two weekly clinics, one at the Royal Hampshire Hospital and one in Doncaster. Um, and I also have an academic role, so I'm also a professor of movement disorders neurology. And in that role, uh, I've been leading the Parkinson's disease research program for some time in Sheffield now. And this included a drug screening effort and uh, I will now be delighted to tell you more about our work, but of course this recording is done in the context of the amazing fundraising effort which has been launched by our wonderful university, University of Sheffield. You might want to ask yourself, well, why, why, are we having actually, why do we actually need to have this Q&A session? Um, well, it's simply because people have so many questions about Parkinson's disease. What type of disease is Parkinson's and what causes it? Parkinson's disease is a brain disease, so it's not due to trapped nerve, it's not due to you know, muscle stiffness or anything else. It's due to the fact that cells die in the brain. Uh, and most of them die in a particular rather small area of the brain called the black substance of the substantia nigra. But eventually the cell death spreads to other parts of the brain. What causes it? So we're not sure about this yet, to be honest with you, and that is one of the key reasons why we badly need to do more research. It's quite clear that in some patients, genetics plays a very important role. So in some patients, a single gene causes Parkinson's disease. But at least in, in the United Kingdom, that's rare. Only about 1% of all people out there with Parkinson's will have developed Parkinson's because they've got this familial subtype. However, we know that genetic risk factors are quite important, and then other things are important, for example, exposure to pesticides, to herbicides. And more recently, there's been a strong focus on the microbiome. So these are the guts, uh, these are the um, bugs in our gut. They may also contribute to, um, the micro, uh, to uh, us developing Parkinson's. But there is still an awful lot we don't know about this condition. Who can get Parkinson's disease? Are you born with it? Is it hereditary? Anybody can get it. Um, it's a little more common in um, blokes than in women, but you know the ratio is about three to two. Um, are you born with it? So some patients do have a gene defect which causes Parkinson's, which does make it hereditary, but that is really quite rare in the United Kingdom. How do you know if you've got Parkinson's disease? Patients first typically get referred to us because they've developed tremor, so shaking typically just of one hand, or they've developed other motor symptoms, such as um, problems with walking. They slow down, they develop a stoop posture, or they can also develop problems with, um, with their fine finger movements, such as problems with doing the buttons. This is what's called a slowly progressing neurodegenerative disorder. So the disease does get relentlessly worse, but it doesn't get worse quickly. Eventually, the patient will not only um, develop motor symptoms, but might also develop so-called non-motor symptoms, such as problems with, with their memory, um, such as problems with constipation. And some patients also develop the dreaded neuropsychiatric problems. So this is problems with anxiety, with depression, they lose confidence and so on. That's by no means the case in every patient, but it is unfortunately quite common. What's life like for someone living with Parkinson's and how does it affect their families? The beginning of the illness, after the initial diagnosis has been made, the drugs can often work remarkably well. And for me, this is probably the biggest joy of looking after so many patients with Parkinson's disease. You can really give them their old life back. So they can go back to line dancing, they can go back to walking, to running, to knitting, to pursuing their hobbies. I've had wonderful presents from my patients to demonstrate that they can paint again, that they can undertake woodcraft again and all these things. And why is that? It's because we've got very powerful symptomatic treatment. So the drugs can help with the motor symptoms, they can improve the clumsiness, they can help with the tremor, they can help with the walking and so on. However, as the disease progresses, these drugs for the motor symptoms tend to work less and less well, and patients then also develop 
some dreaded side effects some complications on these uh, drugs what's more unfortunately we're not very good yet at treating the dreaded non-motor symptoms in particular um, the anxiety issues the depression and and the memory impairment and whenever I teach my undergraduate medical students on Parkinson's disease I always tell them if you just remember one thing about Parkinson's remember it's not just a movement disorder it affects so many other aspects of our um, life it affects the body in so many different ways so how does it affect their families it really affects the entire family uh, it has enormous implications you know just think of simple things you know you might struggle more to go for a walk together uh, or you know the, the partner may no longer be able to help as much in, in the kitchen or with other chores but there are also so many other things you know pursuit of other hobbies or maybe more importantly still the risk um, the very real risk for these patients to lose their jobs and so on and and then of course also just to to live with somebody who's got an illness which in front of your eyes will get relentlessly worse what treatments are available for parkinson's and how do they help Many of the motor symptoms Parkinson patients develop are due to the deficit of a particular chemical called dopamine. So we're quite good at putting dopamine back into the brain of patients with Parkinson's. We have three different classes of drugs um, which are really quite good at doing that um, in the first few years. And indeed, in some patients, the drugs continue to work for, for a long time. However, that is the exception. The longer a patient is on medication, the more likely they are to only experience a limited effect of the medication, and they're also more likely to develop side effects. How does the disease progress is another question I've been asked. So it does progress in every patient. There's no point in beating around the bush. That's just what happens in everybody. But what puzzles me every time I do a clinic, what puzzles the entire field is that the illness progresses in a completely different way in one patient to the next. So some patients continue to only progress very, very slowly. Others progress really quickly. And the vast majority are, of course, somewhere in between. But, you know, you, it's then even the case that some features progress quite quickly. For example, the ability to walk, whereas other important brain functions remain maintained for example the memory in other patients it's it's the other way around every patient is different but the key problem we face the key problem that patients have with what we can offer today is that our treatment is still very much 19th century medicine we're still treating every patient in exactly the same way which is just so stupid it's just not good enough but at the moment we simply can't do any better we badly need to move um, the things forward though we badly need to develop what's called a personalized medicine approach or precision medicine approach. what's different about the research you're doing here at Sheffield well of course good or even excellent research is on Parkinson's disease is also carried out elsewhere but the main focus here in Sheffield really is personalized medicine. So really to find better ways to identify what's wrong in every single individual patient and then treat his or her Parkinson's disease. And that's what we've really been focusing on um, over the last 15 years. Just to give you an example, um, we've been studying the effect of drugs in Parkinson's disease patient tissue for some time now. So this was a study which um, we carried out some years ago initially in, in genetic subtypes of Parkinson's, but later on also in, in the tissue of patients with sporadic Parkinson's disease, which is much more common. We screened 2000 drugs for their rescue effect on a particularly important mechanism um, and that's the rescue of the cell batteries and mitochondria we know that there is something quite wrong with the function of the mitochondria in all forms of parkinson's disease both in the sporadic form and in all forms of 
familial Parkinson's disease. Um, and we then screened 2,000 drugs for their rescue effect on the Parkinson's disease faulty mitochondria. We identified a marked rescue effect of a drug called also the oxycholic acid or UDCA. It's a fascinating drug in that it's actually, it's a bile acid. So we're producing it ourselves in our own body, um, but it's also um, synthesized um, as a drug. It's made as a drug um, and has been used as a drug for decades for liver disease. And that meant that we just knew this drug is safe in patients. Um, and uh, after some years, we then managed to get enough money to take UDCA in a, into a clinical trial. And we're doing this clinical trial now. It's called the UP study for also the oxycholic acid in Parkinson's disease. The study is progressing really well. We're doing this together with University College London, UCL. Um, and I'm very proud to report uh, that, you know, we've managed to keep the trial going despite COVID-19, which was a major effort. But we're, we're very hopeful that we can complete this trial. And that's really, you know, just such a brilliant example of what we can do here in Sheffield because of, you know, the close collaboration between basic scientists like Heather Morty Boyce, at Citron and myself, um, that we first screen drugs at the bench and that we can then take drugs from the bench into our own patients at the clinical research facility of the Sheffield Teaching Hospitals. That is such a unique strength. And, you know, I just want to do more and more of this research. So how long will it be until there's a cure for Parkinson's? To be honest with you, I'm not sure we should be talking about the cure. This would just raise such incredible expectations. So I would want to be careful here. Let me rephrase the question. How long will it be until we can stop the disease from getting worse? Because remember, you know, in the early stages, when, we, you know, when I newly diagnose a patient and I then start on medication, you know, some people refer to this as the, as the honeymoon period of Parkinson's disease treatment. You know, you wouldn't notice it. I wouldn't notice it. If I, if I saw a patient with early Parkinson's on medication in, in a restaurant or a pub or whatever, I wouldn't spot that they've got Parkinson's. That's, that's just, you know, to show you how well the medication can work in the early stages. If we just managed to arrest the illness at that stage, that would already be such a fantastic, life-changing improvement for these patients. Funding research, especially clinical trials, is really expensive. How are small donations going to help? So yes, you're right, research is expensive, very expensive. Clinical trials are really expensive and complicated, but that should not stop us from trying. Um, and, you know, there is, there's a very good quote from, um, from somebody who's spent their life supporting medical research. If you think research is expensive, try disease. Because we know, for example, that um, just in the United States, the, the annual costs, the costs every year arising from Parkinson's exceed $50 billion. That's just in the United States and just for one year. So if you add it all up, you know, loss of income and so on, never mind the human suffering. So why, why do we need small, small sums? It's simple to answer this question. Everything adds up. Every, every little sum, you know, will add up to more and more little sums will add up to bigger sums. And the more money we will have, the more research we will be able to undertake. Why do we need donations now? How will it help our research? And why should someone make a gift to Sheffield? So I don't want future Parkinson patients to uh, still be in the same position in the future. I don't want them to end up in a nursing home. I don't want them to uh, be faced with a similar situation where they might have to go through self-isolation again or or similar scenarios. Why do we need donations now? There are several different reasons for this. So research is expensive. We're doing well in Sheffield with attracting grants. It's probably a little more difficult to attract big grants in Sheffield than it would be um, in Oxford or Cambridge, but we're doing well. Um, but 
we want to do more and it will be particularly important to to pump prime research which will allow us to get bigger grants still it will be particularly important to build on our success for example you know, it'd be wonderful to get more money to study mechanisms which lead to pain in parkinson's disease and how we can deal with that it would be extremely helpful if we could not only study um, the malfunction of the cell batteries and mitochondria but also you know uh, investigate other mechanisms for example inflammation and as a clinician who's leading a clinical trial i would also be so interested in doing more research on on how we can actually do better clinical trials in the future and we're already collaborating very closely with other centers of excellence at the university of sheffield We've got a fantastic imaging center um, at Sheffield Teaching Hospitals at the uh, university. We've got a fantastic center for digital technology in Signo. I'm collaborating with both of them. We're using modern imaging techniques to, to scan the patients before and after they've had the drug trial, um, but before and after they've taken the drug, um, the study drug to see whether the drug has a rescue effect on the cell batteries in the brain. And here in Sheffield, we really have a proud record of um, using donations well for brain research, for neuroscience research, for research on um, drug discovery, uh, for these neurodegenerative conditions, for Parkinson's, for motor neuron disease, for Alzheimer's disease. Many of the patient charities um, are in dire financial straits at the moment because of COVID-19. Many of them have stopped their research support programs for the time being. They no longer give grants to support research because of COVID-19. They've had uh, a very, very severe dent in their own income. So we are desperate to look for other sources to, to finance our research to make sure that we can continue with our research. So please help us donate money for Parkinson's research here in Sheffield. It will be used to develop novel approaches for personalized medicine. It will be used for exciting research projects which have the real potential to transform patients' lives. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye and auf Wiedersehen.